Good afternoon and bienvenidos. I am Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Mellon Foundation, and I am so excited to welcome you and to uh, prepare to join in this conversation, Puerto Rico now, exclamation point on both sides. Um, we'll be conducting our discussion this afternoon in English, but as you noticed when you registered for the program, there is also live Spanish and ASL interpretation and captioning available. So if you would like a link to watch those streams, please email events at melon, M-E-L-L-O-N dot O-R-G. Uh, we would love for you to say hola in the chat and to share where you're watching from. I see this chat is just streaming, streaming, streaming with folks from all over the place, Littleton, Colorado, Washington, DC, Guayama, Puerto Rico, people are, are, are all over the Bronx, Harlem, uh, uh, people are downtown Brooklyn. Um, so um, people are, are joining us from all over, which is which is really a wonderful thing. And we hope to see lots of, uh, I, I, no doubt, we will have lots of audience engagement in the chat. And we'll turn to audience Q&A at the end of the discussion. So it's now my great pleasure to formally introduce our event, uh, beginning by saying what you already know, what brought you here. Puerto Rico is a vibrant, varied, multivocal, culturally exquisite, ferocious, beautiful, mighty place that raises powerful questions about so many of the challenges we collectively face in the turbulent 21st century and will offer us also insights for how we might work to resolve some of those challenges, especially through the arts, culture, and humanities. For decades, I have had uh, personally an abiding interest and devotion to the people, culture, and history of La Isla and its diaspora. Uh, as someone uh, born to Harlemites in Harlem, USA, uh, infused uh, with, uh, with, with New York uh, culture and soul and spirit um, that um, are a precious part of my heart. Um, when I joined Mellon as its president in 2018, one of the first steps I took, my first initiative, was creating the Foundation's Puerto Rico Initiative. And undertaking that work has meant a, a deeply rewarding learning and listening process for all of us at Mellon. In that time, since 2018, we've convened and collaborated with dozens and dozens of artists, scholars, funders, educators, and other leaders from across Puerto Rico and the diaspora. We've engaged in intensive research and discovery, built meaningful relationships, and had powerful conversations about place and purpose. We bring the same commitment to large institutions as to smaller community organizations and support those who have not had access to U.S. national funders. Together with our partners in this work, we have tried to shape a holistic initiative that's rooted in a steadfast and long-term dedication to Puerto Rico's dynamic arts, culture, and humanities sectors. So as leading funders in such work in Puerto Rico and the diaspora, Mellon has made over 30 grants, totaling more than $25 million since 2018, and are excited to continue this um, support in years to come. Uh, before we begin our conversation, I want to just touch on a couple of key points. Um, today, I will use the term continental US and 50 states rather than mainland when referring to the United States. I will refer to Puerto Rico both as the island and the archipelago maybe La Isla sometimes, in recognition of the fact that Puerto Rico is in fact uh, composed of many islands. And all of these terms, as we know, but saying for the entire uh, audience, carry political weight and power dynamics um, that remain unresolved. And for that same reason, you have already heard me reference and will continue to hear me talk about the diaspora. Um, and this is very um, intentional and very key to the way at Mellon uh, that we, we, we think about Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican-ness. Uh, there are currently about 6 million Puerto Ricans living across the 50 states and about 3 million Puerto Ricans living across the archipelago, many in continual motion and flow. And so we're very, very interested in uh, what issues that brings up and about uh, the internal diversity uh, within that flow. Uh, we are also interested in conceptions of and conversations about race 
in Puerto Rico, many and varied, uh, different on the island in the diaspora throughout the continental United States and from living room to living room. Uh, finally, uh, there are still existing colonial dynamics that we acknowledge and remain vigilant not to replicate further. Uh, so joining us today to discuss Puerto Rico now are our three amazing guests, Alana Casanova Burgess, Dr. Yarimar Bonilla, and Danielle Lind Ramos. Alana Casanova Burgess is host and producer of the critically acclaimed podcast, La Brega, Stories of the Puerto Rican Experience. Her award-winning audio journalism includes reporting for WYNC's, or NYC sorry, on the media and Blindspot, Tulsa Burning, for which she and her colleagues were honored with the DuPont Columbia University Award. Her work has been featured in outlets as varied as The Guardian, The New Yorker, Radio Hour, and Latino USA. Dr. Yarimar Bonilla is a political anthropologist, professor, writer, and director of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College both an accomplished scholar and a prominent public intellectual who lends her voice so often to um, mainstream media, which is so, so, so helpful to educating people uh, about, about our issues. Yarimar is a leading voice on questions of Caribbean and Latinx politics and of sovereignty, citizenship, and race across the Americas. She's the author of, author of Non-Sovereign Futures, French Caribbean Politics in the Wake of Disenchantment and with Marisol Lebron, Aftershocks of Disaster, Puerto Rico Before and After the Storm. Her current book project, for which she was named a 2018 Carnegie Fellow, examines the politics of recovery in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria and the forms of political and social trauma that the storm revealed. And Danielle Lind Ramos, who is joining us from Museo de Arte Contemporáneo in Puerto Rico, is one of our very, very great contemporary artists today. He is a renowned sculptor and painter who transforms everyday objects into sculptural assemblages that embody the social history, religious rituals, and built and natural environments of his Afro-Puerto Rican community. Danielle's work has been exhibited in solo and group exhibitions at venues including the Museo de Arte de Puerto Rico, the Whitney, the National Gallery, and the Grand Palais. He is a retired senior professor from the University of Puerto Rico, Umacao campus, and among his many awards and fellowships, he received a MacArthur Genius Award in 2021. Alana, Yarimar, and Danielle, we thank you for joining us and we welcome you. Thank you. Um, so, and again, these comments are so wonderful. An all-star panel, I certainly <laughs> agree. Um, so we're going to open with, a, you know, a, a big and beautiful question uh, that I hope you will take in all of its breadth. Uh, what is Puerto Ricanness for you? And how are you exploring that in your work? Who would like to start? Okay, well, Alana. I'll, I'll jump in. Okay, Alana. Alana should go. Definitely. No, no, I could see you. You were you you were on it, Yeti. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, Alana made a whole podcast about what is Puerto Ricanness, right? I think a big part of what Puerto Ricanness is, is La Brega, is, is the struggle, right? Um, I think for me, as a, as a political anthropologist, I, what, of, what I've had to focus on more is less what is Puerto Ricanness, but really what is Puerto Rico as a kind of political mm -hmm. unit, uh, as a polity. And I think that part of, of what defines what is Puerto Rico-ness is the constant search to answer that question of what is Puerto Rico? Is it a colony? Is it not? Some, for some people, it's not. For some people, it had been decolonized in the 1950s, although uh, more and more since the debt crisis and the recent Supreme Court cases, um, a lot more people agree that it's a colony and there is a lot more agreement on its need for decolonization. Um, is it a territory? What does that mean? Is it in the territorial clause for legal scholars? That's like really important. Um, and I think for myself growing up, having come of age politically and intellectually in the 1990s, it was a moment where we were trying to think also the difference between a nation politically and a nation culturally. 
And so I mm-hmm. think part of what a, a lot of people have also been thinking about is, okay, aside from these questions of politically, are we a colony? Are we a territory? Are, are we decolonized or not? Are we also a nation? And, and if so, what are the bounds of that nation? I love that you started uh, the webinar by making space for talking about the archipelago and the, the kind of the, necess- the need to move across terms, to move from Isla to archipelago, diasporic communities, et cetera, because we are this kind of decentralized uh, community that is tethered to a motherland in many ways, but not mm-hmm. completely bound to that motherland. Mm. Thank I'll, you. I'll tap in. <laughs> I'll Please. tap in now. Uh, <laughs> so, so yes, it is La Brega, the struggle, right? The, the way that we have to find creative solutions around things. But um, now everything is about a vibe, right? We're all talking about vibes in 2022. <laughs> and I think that the vibe around Puerto Rico in my work, and, and I'm glad that I don't have to be really figuring out what Puerto Ricanness is on my own because I work on this team where all these different ways of being Puerto Rican are represented. But we think a lot about nostalgia as a vibe mm-hmm. to Puerto Ricanness. You know, we poke at this, I poke at this a lot in my reporting is that we are constantly yearning for something, right? For people of the diaspora like myself who were born in the US, there's this yearning for this idea of a Puerto Rico that we actually like we're, we're not born in. Um, for people of my mother's generation who grew up there and, and came here later in life, there's this yearning for home that's just very mm-hmm. nostalgic as well. Um, ideas on the island about history and sort of what were the glory days? Were those glory days there? Do we consider the history with rose-colored glasses? And then also this yearning yearning for the future, I think is really interesting. It's something that we're thinking about a lot um, at La, on the team with La Brega. Like what is, what is a better vision that we could be imagining for the future of Puerto Rico? And there's a sort of nostalgia in that as well, although nostalgia is obviously uh, a, a vibe about the past, <laughs> use that word vibe again, but it's all very bittersweet. Um, and so mm-hmm. I think about that in terms of defining what Puerto Ricanness is to me. You know, there's there's no handbook for it, obviously. Mm. Thank you. For me, Daniel. for me, uh, for me, being Puerto Rican, uh, Puerto Ricanness has something to do with a strong sense of belongingness, and that belongingness is based on shared stories, shared experience, shared culture. And when I'm, I'm talking about uh, shared stories, of course, I am talking about the political story of Puerto Rico and its relationship with the United States. Uh, of course, I, I'm talking about Puerto Rico as a territory, as a colony of the United States. But at the end, uh, is that strong sense of belongingness. Mm. And I wonder just for everybody as a follow-up, if there were a word, a phrase, a a sense, an image, a sentimiento, what would you say, how would you encapsulate to pick one thing? I'm going to pick La Brega. (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) I'll go mm-hmm. I'll go with that sense of nostalgia of, of wanting. Yeah. Yeah. I, would say, I, I, would say, I also like that. Yeah. Daniel, go ahead. No, I would say Puerto Rico nombre al pensamiento grato. Will you trans- translate that, please? Nombre al pensamiento. Puerto Rico, nombre al pensamiento grato. Name of, 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 a, of, a, of a thought that is uh, pleasurable, that is uh, ah. delightful. <laughs> yes, ah, I like that a lot. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. You but you know, I, I, I think Alana was also getting at something, at, at this striving to this desire. I think also uh, Puerto Rican, this is also about this, this desire for something that a nostalgia for something we've never had in a way for this dream deferred i mean in in the diaspora you feel it most strongly uh the classical song of the diaspora in mi viejo san juan 
uh, where the lyrics say, maybe I'll come back. I hope I'll come back. There's this constant idea of, of return, um, which is in many ways an impossible return because you can never really go back, right? And, and I think even for people in Puerto Rico also, there's this desire of, for what we could be. We think that, that we have so much potential. We think our best assets are our people, our community. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of Puerto Ricans feel that we've never been able to really live up to that full potential. That, that be it uh, politics, economics, different things have held us back from really fulfilling all that we could possibly be. And I think there's, a, mm -hmm. there's still a kind of yearning for that full potential realized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, let's talk about place um, and thinking about yourselves um, in uh, the context of, of, uh, of place, uh, the island, the diaspora. Could you share with us a specific place that deeply influences your work and what are some of the memories and textures and meanings that you associate with, with that particular place? I feel like Yeti Mud and I are now playing Jeopardy. Is there a buzzer that we can hit really quickly? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I will. I will jump in and say Levitown, which is a suburb of mm. San Juan. Um, in the first season of La Brega, uh, for those who haven't heard it, it's a it's a narrative podcast, so it's you know very produced and reported. Um, we take listeners to Levitown, which is maybe like thirty minutes outside of San Juan. If anyone here has heard of the first American suburb, Levitown on Long Island, this was built by the same company, Lovett and Sons. My grandparents moved back to Levitown from the Bronx in the 70s as a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans returning to the island moved there because it had this familiarity to them. It had this cachet, this middle class dream. And people imagine, you know, Yari mentioned uh, Emi Viejo San Juan. I think people in, in the sort of imagination of what Puerto Rico looks like, El Viejo San Juan comes up, right? We imagine that that is what Puerto Rico looks like, or it's a beach or something like that. And it, yes, it is those places and Puerto Rican history does take place there. But it, to me, Puerto Rico looks like an American suburb in many ways, but it looks mm. like an American suburb where Puerto Ricanness asserts itself, where people are mm. still mm. flying the Puerto Rican flag, where, you know, um, there's a detail in, in that piece where uh, land crabs, because Levitown was built on a, a filled in swamp. So land crabs would continually get into the washing machines and clatter around in there. And so you have this sense mm -hmm. of like Puerto Ricanness asserting itself even in this most American of landscapes. And I, I love that. And I love the sense that, you know, you can go to Marshall's, another quintessentially Puerto Rican place, and you can see Bombay Plena. You know, I love this. Um, the sense that Puerto Rico is always making itself known, even in these places that we don't expect it to be. Um, people might be surprised that Marshalls is so Puerto Rican, but I don't think I've ever been to Puerto Rico and not gone into a Marshalls. Um. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love that. I have a friend who jokes that in Puerto Rico, all these like chains that in the U.S. are no longer popular are, are very popular. Like, is it? One of the places you'll find the most Puerto Rican food is like at El Sisler, like at the Sisler buffet, they'll have like a rice with, with uh, sausages and all these kind of traditional Puerto Rican food. Because in many ways, I mean, Puerto Rican is, is about creolization. It's about, you know, taking all this colonial input that we've had from both the, Span the Spanish colonialism and the US colonialism and transforming it, you know, and making our own culture through that, through those elements. Um, but I have to say, for me, I thought about this question of the place that has most impact in my thinking about Puerto Rico, and it's actually Chicago, and, and shout out to the folks in Chicago, I know some of them are watching. Um, for me, that's where I discovered what diaspora meant, because I, I grew mm -hmm. up in the in the vaivén, in the coming and going. I, I was born in Puerto Rico, but lived, uh, you know, went to first grade and, and, and grew up in Kansas, in Topeka, Kansas, where there wasn't a strong diasporic community. Uh, uh, it was just kind of my family and their children. And, and then I lived in Arizona. I lived in all different places where there were Puerto Ricans, but there wasn't a sense of community in the way that I experienced in Chicago. And so uh, I don't know if people know, like the largest monument to a flag in the world is in Chicago and it's the Puerto Rican flag uh, that sits on Paseo Boricua on Division Street. 
and there is a community there that that is uh, for 50 years now uh, has been holding strong against uh, colonization, against gentrification, against the attempt to erase our history, against the attempt to to impose assimilation. And they've been reinventing what that Puerto Rican nation can mean, what that idea of the nation that is not tied to a state, um, what that can mean from outside the boundaries of the homeland, while still very much working towards the homeland and being deeply invested in what happens in that homeland. So when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, uh, I w every Thursday I would leave Hyde Park and go to Humboldt Park and hang out with the folks there. And for me, the textures, the memories that come back is the feeling. And for a while I lived on California Avenue where I could see the flag right from, from mm -hmm. outside my door. And I would walk out and I would feel like I was in a small town in Puerto Rico. Everyone was like yeah. walking down the street with, with salsa music playing. Everyone knew each other because so it was also mm. about really kind of keeping a community together that was being displaced because of gentrification of the west side of Chicago. And so that feeling of communityness and of, of, of being connected and of trying to build something together, I've, I, I think maybe because in Puerto Rico I've lived in San Juan, so I've not had the small town mm -hmm. experience in Puerto Rico. The closest I've come to living in a small town is on, on the west side of Chicago, and I, I adored mm. it. Mm, mm. Yeah. In my case, of course, Loisa. Loisa, the community of Loisa, my family, my friends, you know, the traditions, a lot of uh, aspects of that culture uh, uh, obviously have formed me. And lately in my life, all of those experiences have been uh, coming to my images. So, mm -hmm. uh, Loisa, I have to tell, of course. And just to say more, because I was fortunate enough when we first met to to sit with you on that main street in Loisa in your space um, and hearing some about your mother, your grandmother, kids in the neighborhood, uh, you know, and, and a whole cultural way of being uh, in the community uh, that you were, you know, trying to nourish uh, as it reflected the way that you grew up. Could you talk more about that, about your your space and what you're trying to do now? Of course, uh, when I, I was a child, I was lucky to live near Castor Ayala. Castor Ayala uh, was a mass maker, among other things, very well known in Puerto Rico. And the beautiful thing is that Castor Ayala gave us uh, jobs to do. And mm -hmm. all of those jobs were related with the pantry. Right? So for us living in Loisa at that time, we were uh, also, uh, all, almost living under a palm tree. And the products mm -hmm. from the palm tree, we used to use it, use them, not only for making crafts and art, but also to construct uh, houses and mm -hmm. uh, to make food. So there were a lot of activities related with the palm tree. Palm tree, uh, I would say, was um, uh, identity. By the way, when I used to play uh, baseball, the team, uh, was named Cocoteros de Loisa. So what I'm trying to say <laughs> is that there were there were a lot of cultural activities in my community, and it was beautiful. The first time that I saw uh, brushes and, and pigment for painting, it was in my house, because in my house my mother uh, was a craft maker, my grandmother was a sewer, my uncle was a cabinet maker, and my younger uh, uncle was a mask maker. So. I saw mm. all of those activities in my house and I started painting in my house. And then the products that mm. I lately developed or made, I used to uh, carry them to Castor Ayala because Castor Ayala gather mm. all of those products from the community and take them to Old San Juan to be sold. So every oh. Monday we, we wait because he will be bringing money for us. So it was like a mm. beautiful for formation, early formation for me as an artist. And I remember that that uh, Castor Ayala's uh, atelier workshop mm -hmm. was full of, of different products, different pieces of works made of uh, the products of the pantries, but also he used to paint a lot too. And the, my first experience mm. with a Garita de San Juan was in one of those paintings, you know. So for me, that uh, uh, years of formation, I would say, in Loisa were great and beautiful. And later on, as I said before, 
I started to incorporate the uh, memory of those activities in what I am doing right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, to some individual questions about your work, um, Alana, the two versions of La Brega, one in English and one in Spanish, um, are not straight translations. Uh, they are each their own things, their own podcasts in terms of conversations, perspectives, and histories that you're exploring. Incredibly interesting. Could you talk some, some more about that? Absolutely. Yeah, we call them bespoke translations. They're not exact. So we do change anecdotes. Um, you know, if, if uh, the English episode, um, you hear more English and uh, we paraphrase some of the Spanish and vice versa, although we do, you know, we let the Spanish, the beautiful Puerto Rican accent uh, breathe in both versions. We also make jokes in Spanish that we might not make in mm -hmm. English because it's hard to explain a joke sometimes. Um, and we did this because early on in the process of making the first season, our editor at the time made an important observation to us, which is how frustrating it is. He, he lives in Puerto Rico and he observed how frustrating it is when good journalism is made in English about the island. And um, it, it's more frustrating when bad journalism is made um, in English. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that, that could we do something where the people we were interviewing would always be able to understand the work that was being made about them. Um, and that, you know, that that's just incredibly important to our philosophy now. So we do these two versions. We're very careful with the words that we choose. Um, you know, there are some things that we explain and some things we don't, but one of the surprising elements of this project has been how, how, much the central story is relevant for these two groups of audiences. And, and often we hear that listeners listen in both languages because they're curious to hear the Easter eggs of how they're different. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, a, a good example is that we did an episode about uh, las carpetas, carpeteo, in the first season. So this is a practice, this is uh, from Puerto Rican history. For decades, there was a surveillance program on the island that targeted the independence movement. And anyone who was even um, thought to be associated with it. So when people say, ah, cuidado, te van a carpetear, it means like, careful, they're going to surveil you, they'll make a folder about you. And the number mm -hmm. of people who wrote to us in Spanish saying, you know, I grew up hearing this phrase all the time, and I didn't truly understand what it meant to be carpeteado, what a carpeta was, mm -hmm. was astonishing. But of course, we talk all the time about how crummy our textbooks are everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like the, the sense of history that we get in the United States is not great. Um, the sense of colonial history that's taught in Puerto Rico is also not complete. It's, it's barely there. And so, yes, we do these linguistic changes, but I feel like the history that we are telling is just as relevant to a Spanish speaking audience as it is to an English speaking one. Um, and so we're sort of creating you know, this experiment in solidarity with, with these two versions so that the audience can be having the same conversation even in two different languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And could you be um, a historian for us for a minute, um, for our, uh, you know, audience coming from so many different um, perspectives and knowledge bases. And, you know, there many people are very surprised when they learn um, that there are more Puerto Ricans living in the continental U.S. Uh, than uh, in Puerto Rico. So could you, you know, just in a nutshell, how did this happen? And but why is it relevant? Yes, um, pull up a chair. Uh, so, we, <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess we could start the story a bit in the 1940s. Um, the historians listening might be in the chat now saying, oh, she's not qualified. Um, but it, there was this sense from the Puerto Rican government and from the US government that Puerto Rico needed to develop from an agrarian system to an industrialized system. In part, this was because in part, this was because Puerto Rico needed to be developed as a kind of showcase of capitalism in the Caribbean. It, it at a certain point needed to be considered in the same breath as Cuba, right? Cuba is a communist bastion and Puerto Rico had to be, um, you know, the, the U.S. pearl to show what capitalism could do. So there was the sense also that um, that it was sort of the the 
the U.S. had to do something to help Puerto Ricans. They were they were a too many of them, and they were too poor. And how could you develop an economy? I'm I'm saying this in this sort of sarcastic voice now. I don't believe yeah. this. Um, but uh, how could you develop an economy with all these people, especially because an industrialized economy needs fewer people than an agrarian one? So there are too many Puerto Ricans. What do we do? And there are a number of different solutions to this problem. I say solutions in quotation marks. But um, there was a lot of um, birth control and uh, forced and not. Um, but there was also this idea that cities in the north, um, New York, Chicago, which Yeti might have mentioned, um, needed cheap labor. And so the government, both the Puerto Rican government and the US government, created these programs to encourage migration to the US. Um, it wasn't forced, but it was inc incredibly encouraged. So you had educational programs in schools where kids were taught about how great New York City was and how great it would be to speak English. You had government offices that were about helping people get employment in places like New York. Um, and you had cheap flights. The, the airlines were a big part of this in order to encourage migration. And so you had this huge flow of migration um, to the United States. Um, and at the same time, you had this uh, Operation Bootstrap, Mano Jala Obra, which was changing the economy of the island, of the archipelago. Um, so your second, the second part of your question was about why, why it's relevant, right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's relevant because in some ways it's happening again today. It is incredibly difficult to live in Puerto Rico as a Puerto Rican. Um, there's enormous gentrification. The cost of living is incredibly high. Uh, there are power outages all the time and also water outages. And the sense that Puerto Rico is becoming a playground for the rich is uh, very present. And there is more and more evidence of policies that seek to deter Puerto Ricans from uh, living in Puerto Rico. Um, and I don't know if Daniel and Yari want to step in and add to the, the factor of relevance at this point. But um, yes, that is essential. That is my nutshell. I hope I hope I did that it was a, that was perfect thank you any any additions well I, I think Alana did a beautiful job there and I think you know I, I'm always struck by the fact that the Puerto Rican Labor Department was the only labor department that had a migration division I mean that was part of the, the idea of how to deal with employment and similarly after Hurricane Maria it was the first time that FEMA built an air bridge uh, that part of the policy of recovery was once again displacing folks out of their community. So I think that it's just systematically over time, displacement has been uh, seen as a solution to Puerto Rico's problems. And it's incredibly mm -hmm. problematic, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the chat, there's a lot of really interesting um, testimony from folks talking about their own uh, family history, people whose families uh, picked tobacco in, uh, in Connecticut um, along the river out, outside of Hartford, um, agricultural workers in Pennsylvania, um, uh, apple, onion, lettuce picking in, in upstate New York and Rochester. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, of really um, edifying and, conversation going on. Yeah. And I would just add to, to what Alana was saying before about how, uh, you know, our textbooks fail us, uh, both in Puerto Rico and in the United States. I often, when I teach about Puerto Rico in my classes, I always want to start by telling my students, do not feel bad that you don't know this history because a lot of students come in and even, and especially those who are Puerto Rican, they feel a sense of shame that they don't know their history or, or guilt. Um, and, and I tell everyone, you know, when they walk in the door, like, you don't feel upset, feel, but do feel angry, you know, like, do mm -hmm. kind of demand that the history be known, because part of what, I always like to quote this line from a very cheesy Hollywood movie uh, that said, part of what makes the American people, the American people is what they don't know, part of what the American people don't know is what makes them the American people, right? So uh, mm -hmm. U.S. history is built on silences, it's built on silencing colonialism. And if you watch um, any of the hearings that happen in Washington where they discuss Puerto Rico's political status, you see how even elected officials, I mean, even at the level of the Supreme Court, when you watch the deliberations or read the transcripts, you can see that even the Supreme Court justices are like, oh, what is this? <laughs> you know, like they, 
there's the, mm-hmm. the, because Puerto Rican history is, and 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 not just Puerto Rican, but the history of the U.S. colonies, which include, of course, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, Samoa, the Philippines, etc. None of that is taught in the U.S. at any moment. Not even not not in mm-hmm. uh, primary school, middle school, high school, grad school, uh, up into law schools. You know, so th- that's mm-hmm. that's one of, of, of I think something that I've been trying to push for lately is like we need to impact that and to recognize the role of colonial history in U.S. history and the role of Puerto Rican mm-hmm. movements, including movements in New York, in Chicago, et cetera, as part of the history of the civil rights movement in the United States, right? And I think that that's part of what is necessary in this country to empower folks so that they're no longer are asking, what is Puerto Rico? What is Puerto Rican-ness? You know, that those questions mm-hmm. come from, from the complete silence around what is Puerto Rico and what is imperialism. And mm-hmm. we need it in Puerto Rico too. Mm-hmm. And then just and, you know, adding yeah. in from oh please, please, we, you know, I was just going to say oh, adding in from the chat, cane workers in, in Hawaii. Uh, uh, you know, cane cane people going to work the cane fields in Hawaii. Uh, uh, people coming to do factory work in Philadelphia, and then watching those factories shut down. And also, what we're seeing in the chat is 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 more overlaying of race. Uh, and you know, and 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 the waves of black and brown people who came uh, at what particular points in time, uh, and then, as you say, Yarimar um, became uh, some of them a part of uh, other kinds of rights movements uh, going on um, in the U.S. So, really, really rich and important. Um, Yarimar, I'd love to hear from you now a little bit about contextualizing Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. And so, um, at the end of this lesson, we will know everything. Um, so what, you know, island sensibilities, political realities, uh, does Puerto Rico share with, with other countries in the Caribbean and, and what is distinct? Again, these are one of these enormous questions, but I'd love to get into this, into this, uh, zone. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, my major when I was at the University of Puerto Rico, proud alum of the UPR, uh, was social sciences general program with a concentration in Caribbean studies. So from the moment I was an undergrad, uh, I started to see an, a, a, the study of the Caribbean as the best way for me to understand Puerto Rico. Because I feel like before I, I was really, you know, opened up to that study of the Caribbean, um, I always felt that Puerto Rico was described as a Latin American nation. Uh, and, and in some ways we are, but in that history, there was so much that I didn't understand about our political history, et cetera. And when I begin to study Guadalupe, Martinique, Curacao, all these other non-sovereign places in the Caribbean, that's when I realized, oh, we're not this oddity because I feel like part of what a lot of Puerto Ricans feel is a sense of shame about our political history, that we have a kind of incomplete political history because we did not follow a, a particular path of independence that is, again, particular. And, and, and to understand Puerto Rico is to understand that it's actually part of a larger system of non-sovereign societies and of different forms mm-hmm. of decolonization, if one wants to imagine it that way, or of um, attempted decolonization, right? So um, in Luis Munoz Marin, who authored um, you know, Puerto Rico's Commonwealth status, we need to, to understand him. We need to think about Emesa Sayre and how Emesa Sayre, one of the biggest you know, mm. thinkers of decolonization, the path that he proposed and followed for Martinique was is not that of independence, but of integration with France. Of course, Emesa Sayre's mm-hmm. vision was that by becoming part of France, this would result in the decolonization of France and that France as a nation would change and transform into a nation that it was not majority uh, white and European, Mm -hmm. but that was a nation now scattered throughout the Caribbean, Africa, etc. So that was the vision that he had. And I think that a lot of folks in Puerto Rico, who, especially those who are interested in statehood, they need to look more at what has happened in the parts of the Caribbean that have incorporated fully into their empires, right? And how, you know, the struggles continue in those places because Emma Sir had this vision that incorporation into France would transform France, but, but it did not, <laughs> you know? And so mm-hmm. I think that as we think about the future political past of Puerto Rico, 
rather than this insistence on seeing Puerto Rico as the last colony or the only colony, the oldest colony. I feel like we Puerto Ricans love to, to kind of grab on to these um, titles. Instead, we need to understand ourselves as part of the system of, um, of alternatively decolonized places or, you know, what, whatever mm -hmm. rubric mm -hmm. you want to choose. Um, Thankfully, at, at Centro, due to the support of the Mellon, we will be focusing directly on this in our decolonization study group to better understand, like, how does our path relate to the path followed by Martinicans, Guadalupeans, but also folks in the Philippines, folks in Guam, folks in Palau. You know, there's now been new conversations about Puerto Rico possibly um, being able to become an associated republic. What in the world is that? <laughs> you know, how, mm -hmm. how are those political relationships negotiated? Um, can we understand that as decolonization? Um, are those treaties uh, negotiated on equal terms by both parties, et cetera? I think there are um, so many questions that for me, um, coming through the Caribbean and then coming back to Puerto Rico has been so important because it allowed me to think about imperialism, colonization, decolonization, all of that outside of just Puerto Rico and the United States. Um, and so that has helped me then understand, okay, there are, of course, many particularities about Puerto Rico, one of them being that um, overlay of colonial empires where it's not just the U.S. colonialism that is present now, but that other foundation of Spanish colonialism and how sometimes when we want to assert our difference from the U.S., what we grab onto are also colonial aspects like Spanish language, you know, or or a lot of, of our kind of non-American culture is Spanish culture, you know? So mm -hmm. so to be able to understand like what how how our approach to shopping malls and marshals and all these things is a form of Puerto Ricanness, we have to then kind of give up on having this authentic pre-colonial base to go back to. And that's something that all of the Caribbean has had to struggle with, right? And, and had to reimagine like, what does it mean to be the product of, you know, uh, of course, uh, the great, you know, diasporic experience, uh, which was the Middle Passage. So, so mm -hmm. the entire culture of the Caribbean has been in many ways, kind of creating on top of this colonial experience and extractive experience of plantation slavery. So I think to be able to imagine a Puerto Rican future, we have to kind of understand that Caribbean historical foundation. Mm, such a rich answer. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, we're now um, going to have a treat and turn uh, to looking at some of Danielle's work and, uh, and, and, and talk about your um, artistic practice. So we have um, a few things uh, that we're going to look at. Um, and I think they will come up on the screen. Ah, here we are. Um, beautiful. Um, so um, we'd love to hear about um, each work as we turn to it, but thinking particularly, um, what are some of the, the histories that you're exploring um, in your work? And also how has your own vocabulary um, and artistic vocabulary and, and use of materials evolved over the years? So another big question, but we could start with this um, amazing piece. All right, uh, talking about history, one of my intentions is to present history to communities. Because I remember when I was in school, public school in Louisa, we didn't knew or heard a lot about, about our Afro uh, history in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. just a few. So uh, this piece, which is called uh, 1797, Vencedor has some do with the historical facts. And that mm -hmm. is when the England army tried to seize Puerto Rico and it received a very strong resistance from the inhabitants of Puerto Rico at that time. But the beautiful thing is that there was, there is a list, a list of uh, a black militia from Loisa with all of mm. its names written there, right? So I said, wow, here's wow. a document, very important uh, to be presented to my community in Loisa very important fact, right? So I made a different uh, expression related with that, especially in Piñones, where it was supposed, it was the place where the English Navy was uh, sown so by the first time. So this one represents the victory 
uh, of Puerto Rican in general, but the participation of the black militia in that victory. That's uh, the reason why mm. the name of it is Vencedor. But I was thinking how I, I'm going to present the, uh, an, image, an image related with a victory, a victory that uh, represents us, I mean, as part of the uh, Puerto Rican uh, population, right? So I thought about uh, materials that are related with our experiences. So, mm -hmm. as I said before, that in Loiza we depend a lot. When I was a child, uh, we depend uh, from the pantry. So we made a lot of uh, objects related with that. So I took that material, the pantry, to uh, include it in this image. That's the reason why uh, the torso of the figure and the head of the yeah. figure and part of the, or other parts of the, of the figure are related with the pantry. So. There, of course, I'm trying to talk about identity, right? Part of the Puerto Rican identity has to be something with Loisa, right? And there mm -hmm. you have the machete, the machete, right? It has something to do with the victory, of course, but it's mm -hmm. also a tool, a tool, very important tool, uh, related again, not only if, uh, with the uh, economy around the pantry, Cutting coconut, opening coconut, but also it's related with other activities, economical activities like uh, fishing crabs. So what I oh. tried to do here in this image was incorporate all of those experiences that I had with materials related with my community. And for example, the, the, the cap, the cap is related with uh, some yeah. of the mm. materials used to in the custom of Puerto Rican masquerade. You know? Of course, I don't want to talk to directly uh, uh, about that masquerade, but I want to suggest that masquerade and those elements yeah, yeah. related with that masquerade. So at the end, that's the image. It represents the victory where we are connected through our ancestors, right? It connected with the history of the Caribbean, but I would try to do it in a very different way uh, based in uh, autochthon or vernacular uh, language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. And then um, also, um, of course, there's the baseball, uh, the baseball mitt, the catcher's mitt that we see in the larger uh, piece down at the bottom. Is that a, a oh, baseball mitt? Yes, yes, yes. Because in, in, there is a coconut there that represents the English uh -huh. army. I don't know if you could identify the colors of the ah. English army. <laughs> right. Okay. And because uh -huh. I used to play... I used to play baseball and I love baseball. I mm -hmm. always want to include my own experience, my personal experience in the image, right? So I am related the capture of the coconut that represents the English, part of the narrative of the victory against the English uh, army. That's the reason why that glove is there with the, uh, holding the coconut, right? Holding the coconut. And as you can see also, I, there are tools really with workers, you know, workers. Yeah. In yeah, yeah. I feel like also in the shape, there's something that reminds me of um, West African sculpture about like, you know, some of the shapes of Akan, maybe, I don't know, sculpture in, in there. Yes, I had in mind uh, a very powerful king related with that uh, narrative, right? A king in, mm -hmm. in, in his horse, a victory king in his ah, horse. But I, yeah, right. Yeah. Like like Shango, you're riding the Shango. Well, this is not Shango, but I am aware of those uh, Orishas. I'm aware of that spirituality in the whole Caribbean, you know. And being from Puerto Rico, that belongs to all of us. So, if I have yes. to use it, I use it, right? I use it. But yes, uh, if I am going to talk about victory, you know, I go back to those uh, images related with victory that belong to us. I mean, connected with our Africa. African ancestor, and I bring it. But I also yeah. wanted to make another, another uh, figure in the horse because in Loiza, Fiesta de Santiago are related with a, a saint that is riding a horse. So I wanted to have an alternative based in our history here in the Caribbean, here in Loiza. So for me, it was very important to make that sculpture related with these important facts where, again, our ancestors participate, defending what they consider they, they, their place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Um, then there's a, another one that I want us to have a look at. Woo! Wow. Uh, 
This is right. amazing. And could you start, because I see some people asking in the chat, give us a sense of, of scale uh, for this piece. Th that one? This one specifically? Yeah. It's, this one it's specifically. Like, uh, yeah, it's like 10, 10 feet high until the top and almost, uh, let's say, eight feet wide. Yeah, it's a big one. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's part <laughs> of... Yeah. <laughs> It's part of a series of Marias that I uh, started to uh, make after, right after the first day that the hurricane passed. This is like the f one, two, three, four one. Yeah, and it's called Maria de los Sustentos. And I wanted to make a figure related with that knowledge, that ancestral knowledge that we use when we have a catastrophe. When lights, electricity is not there, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So we recur, we go back to our uh, ancestral knowledge and we start again with fire. <laughs> and I remember that after Maria, in our community, everything also, right? we have a situation, Let, let's do something, let's cook. We go to the pantries that were fallen, we pick up coconuts, we pick up uh, dry coconut, coconuts, and we start again like using burens to cook, you know. We mm -hmm. started like uh, cooking outside. There was no problem because that knowledge was there. People were fishing. Yeah. You know? But the figures also represent protection, but protection in terms of community, how we in a situation got together you know, uh, and, and help each other. And those uh, yeah. instruments, yeah. those elements, those tools are also related with the first time after the hurricane passed that the first thing that you have to do is how to get out of your house. Many of the houses mm -hmm. are covered by trees or you are almost uh, until here with water. So that's the reason mm. that those two uh, tools that are around are related with cutting or are related with rowing, you know? Because my experience was yeah. that I was in this house and then after I get off the house, I have to uh, pass through a lot of water. You know, by the way, mm. it was uh, there where I found the first object that I used to start with the series of Maria. So this is Maria based on ancestral knowledge that still we need in time of uh, catastrophe. Yeah. Yes, wow, wow. Um, and I, I know in some of the um, other pieces that have that uh, particular blue um, that that you, you use the, the tarps, the roof uh, tarps, I don't know if that's what's happening in this piece as well. Um, in the well, in the blue uh, on the side in the bottom. Well, uh, in the side of the tools, of course, there there, yeah. there, there are the blue tarp, blue tarp related with female. Yeah, it is the tarp. Because, yeah, and with all of the intention, I want to use that material not only in the context of surviving or helping each other, but also in political political terms because FEMA is related with Puerto Rico. It related with the political situation. Puerto Rico, and when a catastrophe comes, FEMA is there. And many people are waiting for FEMA to help, you know. So that's the reason yeah. why sometimes I bring the materials because it's very, it's a very charged, charged material in terms of uh, healing, helping, you know. I remember that from my studio, I saw all those houses covered by the FEMA uh, blue turf, right? Yeah. And many people survive a little few weeks with that there. Regardless of what they think, politically speaking, you know, they used the, the, the term. So you have a situation there where you could present it symbolically in terms of the relationship of Puerto Rico's uh, Puerto Rico colonial situation with the United States. So for me, it's very important to bring it. Yes, yes. Um, and then just uh, the, the last time that I saw your, your work was um, just a, a month ago at the um, Afro-Atlantic's uh, Afro-Atlantic uh, Histories uh, ex exhibition at the um, uh, National Gallery in Washington, uh, having traveled from Houston and before that uh, having spent time, originated in Brazil. Um, and so as to that context for your work, I wonder how you felt about your work in that conversation uh, of, of Afro-Atlantic history, um, and if there is, is more to say about that. Yes, of course. Uh, regardless of our local experiences, 
we have a common experience, which is uh, related with Africa and the event of slavery. And that is still somehow affecting us. Affecting, I mean, that is present, right? So being there with this local expression, but uh, still connected with that uh, mega story of Afro-Atlantic stories, it was great because I thought that Afro Puerto Rican uh, experience was there represented, you know, Afro Puerto Rican experience was there sharing all with uh, this image with all of those uh, other experiences in the Atlantic. And for me, it was great. It was great. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for this beautiful, beautiful in-depth look at your work. Um, and that last question um, relates us to, to a question for everybody um, that I, I think is very, very interesting. Um, in the 2020 census, the percentage of Puerto Ricans who identified as white plummeted from 76% in 2010 to just 17%. Uh, and the percentage of respondents who, I mean, the, the panelists know this, I'm saying this for everybody, <laughs> the percentage of respondents who identified as two or more races increased from 3% in 2010 to 50%. And the percentage of people who identified as black stayed relatively stable. <laughs> so um, I would uh, love a, a parsing of these numbers uh, uh, as uh, a way of, um, of thinking about the the live question of of race in, in Puerto Rico. Well, I'll jump in because I did uh, write a piece about these shifting racial identities that I, I co-authored with my colleague Isar Godro from University of Puerto Rico. And um, Isar and I, what, what we wrote about was how in the wake of Hurricane Maria and also in the wake of Puerto Rico's financial crisis, like we know that there is a kind of bankrupt state in Puerto Rico that no longer can afford uh, cultural preservation, uh, the cultural work of the Instituto de Cultura, et cetera, can no longer afford um, public works, uh, you know, public transportation, all these things. So what impact does that have on the racial work of the state? Because we know that, that uh, part of the work of the state is to produce racial identities. And so our argument is that before the financial crisis, uh, when Puerto Rico had its own census, the race question was omitted. And that's part of why when the race question gets put back in, Puerto Ricans are not trained to answer that question because in the United States, we're constantly uh, being asked, what race are you? And everywhere we go, any form we fill out. And even though those forms are always confusing and, and kind of nonsensical, like we've just, we've developed answers to them. Uh, and it's a training that the state has done in the United States to get us to identify and pick a box. And it's based on the one drop rule that is what you know, dominates in the United States, et cetera. So in Puerto Rico, we didn't have that racial training to answer those questions. Uh, and so the, what my colleague Isara and I found, and, and I specifically, I worked with a group of students in Puerto Rico doing survey research, and we would ask uh, folks at the end of the survey that was about politics and other things, the fiscal control board. And then at the end, we would say, okay, well, so what's your age? What municipality are you from? And what's your racial identity? And when we would ask their racial identity, people would be stumped. They would literally like have long pauses and silences and be confused and ask us what well, what does it say on the form? What are the boxes? Because they, they didn't have a, a, a quickly developed answer to that, right? But we did find that of the people who identified more quickly were those who identified as black. So people who have, mm -hmm. who are dark skin, who have been socialized as Afrodescendiente in Puerto Rico, be it through a proud family heritage or through discriminatory practices that have forced them to reflect on the color of their skin and, and their, their place in the racial hierarchy in Puerto Rico, they had a clear sense of their racial identity. They understood their blackness. But the folks who did not quickly identify as black, they had these long pauses. And then sometimes they would tell us that the question itself was racist, that we shouldn't be asking people their race, that they were part of the human race, which obviously echoes this kind of idea of racial democracy that exists throughout Latin America or, you know, the kind of Latin American version of colorblindness. Um, and so, but that was, we were seeing at the moment and we were doing it, that all of that was shifting uh, as we were studying it. Because I think 
with uh, Hurricane Maria, with the famous toss of the paper towels and, and all of that, mm -hmm. uh, Puerto Ricans realized that they were not white. Or as, as we argue in our paper, that they, they, if they are white, they are white with an asterisk. Uh, a, a kind of qualified whiteness is the term that uh, Isar Godro and I developed um, to think about this idea of Latin American whiteness. And so a lot of the people who did identify as white in our survey, they would, they would give it a, a kind of asterisk or a kind of adjective. So they would say they were white Puerto Rican or they were a, a la, white Latino or they were like, well, I'm considered white here, but not there. And so they had all these caloric answers um, that I think point to first the lack of, of kind of a, an understanding of our racial identity, which has been it is increasingly changing and we're seeing how the each with each census we see a further move away from whiteness um in puerto rico because that has been changed and it's not just the the result of of you know u.s federal discrimination but also of activism of organizations like colectivo ile and others that have done massive campaigns to help uh, Puerto Ricans embrace their Afro identity, their Afro descendencia, and to identify as such on the census, and to also recognize the importance of that ritual. Because again, we didn't have racial statistics in Puerto Rico for a long time. We still uh, don't have reliable racial statistics. And so uh, even though some folks think that this might be a racist question, as, as they told us that when, when we ask folks to identify racially, some folks are still very hesitant to identify racially in Puerto Rico. They think that's an American American thing. Um, I think there is a growing consciousness of like, we would like to be able to say uh, how the pandemic, the earthquakes, the, 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 you know, the, the hurricane, all these different crises that we've had, how have they impacted along the lines of race? We need racial data to be able to say that, right? And so more accurate racial statistics are going to help us better understand the effects of these issues on our, on our different communities and, you know, to have a better sense of what is our racial identity and um, the, the different pathways that people inhabit given their, their racial background, which is something that in Puerto Rico for a long time has been silenced. Thank you. Anything else to add to changing racial identification? Well, I was going to add that um, Yari Med mentioned that the question is fairly new. It, it was actually Luis Muñoz Marin who argued that the question should be removed from the census because race just wasn't even a factor in Puerto Rican society, was, was his argument. And so I often think, I don't know what the conclusion is to this thought, but how Puerto Rican was a race that one could select on the census in New York and yet it racism did not exist in puerto rico at the same time you know like what what was what is the story that the census tells us <laughs> about puerto ricans mm -hmm. in the united states as much as it tells us about race um racial attitudes in puerto rico mm -hmm. well what, what i always tell my what, students is that there's no right or wrong way to do race like race is a colonial imposition it's a it's a social construct and so there's no real biological reality. And so we have to kind of start there and then understand that the census is a product of the U.S. racial state and that it has been geared towards a particular U.S. racial ideology. And so it's not that Puerto Ricans are getting it right or wrong, is that we were socialized under a different racial ideology. And now we're trying to figure out how to utilize this tool uh, that does allow us to tell different stories about our communities so how to best unify this tool that wasn't created for our racial reality. Mm -hmm. And what I'd throw in, and we don't have time to get into all of it now, but um, I should have probably put there's race, but then there's the question of color. Uh, you know, so so regardless of what we think about, um, you know, racial uh, categorization and the census, uh, color uh, and colorism uh, are, are always issues. And, and I think also in diaspora, there are just fascinating questions uh, that we touched on earlier that happen when, you know, folks come to, uh, uh, especially um, cities with black populations and what the, how all of that works itself out. Um, I think also a whole nother set of questions that's coming up um, in the chat that's so important that we don't have time for um, is to think about um, uh, indigenous uh, um, identity and heritage and how that all fits in. So more conversation 
for more time. Um, what I want to do now, there are, we don't have a lot of time left and there are, this is a poppin' chat. So um, let me just, um, I'm going to ask some simple, quick, quick beautiful questions. Um, from Edwin Rios at the City of New Haven Board of Alders. Um, what books or documentaries does the panel strongly recommend uh, to educate me on my Puerto Rican heritage? Um, and then uh, we also have a question. I will tell you in a minute who asked it, um, but about um, art and poetry. So if we could just, you know, popcorn some quick recommendations um, uh, uh, on on things that you think are um, would be really strong for people to have a look at, knowing that we can't cover it all. Maybe Danielle, we start with you. Um, poet, a poet, a, an artist, a documentary, <laughs> a book, something you want us to, to look at. Well, poets. Uh, I have friends in Loiza that are poets, and I am interested in them because uh, they are from there, and I uh, receive energy from there. Uh, sadly, yes. they haven't published, even though they have a lot of uh, written poetry. You know, that is what I could say about them. And how to would Loisa, you come? All right. Come. Yeah, you come to Luisa, and then in my house where you were, we could get together. And I have done that before That's because it. I like to invite, I invite the community and do that. I just recently did I invite the poet, invite the, the the community, and they read poetry there related with Beautiful. our uh, common experience. Yeah, we do that there. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. More recommendations. Um, there's a documentary called Landfall. Um, there yeah. which is which is very good um there's also a novel that was written you mentioned earlier uh the the diaspora in um in hawaii the the puerto rican community in hawaii there's yes. a novel uh there's a novel called the taste of sugar which is by maricel vera which i finished earlier this summer which mm. is uh quite quite beautiful if that's sort of an you know it's an idea that i think we should all uh be more familiar with is how there are puerto ricans everywhere um I, this is sort of an old, this is a, a, an old school, but a classic recommendation of uh, anything by Arcadio Diaz Quiñones. I keep La Memoria Rota on my desk. Um, and, and like, <laughs> uh, should just, you know, just casually. Um, and uh, I'm sure it's translated. It is a beautiful text about memory and Puerto Rico um, that I would really recommend. Oh. And Thank you know, La Brega. Yeah, of yeah, I I will I will co-sign on anything Arcadio Diaz Quiñones <laughs> uh, as as an entry point to Puerto Rico and its diaspora. I think poetry. Uh, I love Tato La Viera. I, I but maybe it's just mm -hmm. because it was transformative for me. I still remember being at the library at the University of Puerto Rico and opening up La Carreta Made a U Turn, a uh, book by mm -hmm. Tato La Viera, and it just educating me on on the diaspora in a way you know that i had not been exposed to before uh and so the the creative i think poetry i think the the new yorican poets uh but uh mm -hmm. i'm biased in that regard <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, this is from Margaret uh, Doyle at Aliada, um, who asks, how can the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Maria this fall serve not only as a moment of commemoration, but also as a call for reparative and forward-looking justice? Well, great question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's hard because I think in some ways the conversation around Puerto Rico has been stuck around Hurricane Maria. Um, I mean, it was it it was it it opened so much attention to the island um, and to the archipelago and to the diaspora, and so I I'm a little cautious around thinking too much even about the anniversary but i know that even as someone who works in media that these anniversaries are ways for us to get attention to subjects that otherwise wouldn't but there's so much that has happened in the last five years i mean a governor was toppled uh there's um mm -hmm. an electricity crisis that actually doesn't even directly have to do with the hurricane itself it has to do more with privatization and forces that were brewing long before that um you know, there was 
Uh, there's coastal erosion as well, which is a, a, a you know a climate issue, an environmental issue, which I know has to do with the hurricane. So I'm feeling a little bit conflicted about all of that. Um, just to say that that you know pinning. I also worry about what happens after the after the anniversary. Does all this attention, all this you know foundation support that has come in after the hurricane, does it evaporate? What do we do? Um, so. Those yeah, I agree with Alana. Yeah, <laughs> at, at Central we we've, we've been discussing. Well, how are we going to commemorate? And and some people say, like a thing that we have to commemorate each, each year. Is this now like a like a national oh. mourning holiday or something? And so uh, some people feel that that we shouldn't, you know. Uh, but, but I I think we need to. Five years is five years, you know. We didn't do mm -hmm. anything big last year for the fourth year, uh, and partly because we were in the you know in the pandemic. Um, but I, I think that part of what we need to do, I know a lot of people are upset about the retelling of the same traumatic tale, you know, and the kind of disaster porn that that can lead to. Uh, but I think it is, it was an important moment in our history that opened up a entirely new political conversations, entirely new political movements. And I think the best way we can honor uh, that and, and honor those we lost and all of that is to honor those who are struggling to create something new. And so I think a kind of forward looking commemoration of like, what is the path that we've been building in the past five years that has been about reclaiming the land, reclaiming our space, pushing back against uh, gentrification, pushing back against displacement, um, and also pushing back against the idea that it's only FEMA and it's blue tarps that, that could save us in times of disaster, when in fact it was mostly those cacerolas, those pans that, that Daniel shows in his art. You know, like, I, I think that that image itself is so telling of how the tarps are such a small part of it. And it was those pans through which we fed ourselves and then we later use them as symbols of protest uh, to, to get rid of the governor. Uh, so I think that all of that celebration of that path that we've been charting towards hopefully something that's not a, a recovery of what was before Maria, but a reinvention of what Puerto Rico could be, I, I think might be the best way. Yeah, mm -hmm. just focusing on agency instead of, you know, there. Are, uh, I think natural disasters bring out often the best in people. Um, and focusing on that sense of agency and power instead of, you know, some fictional idea of, of victimhood. Mm -hmm. um, this question is from Lisa Oppenheim. How does tourism help or hurt Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans? Um, and I think that's an interesting question when you think about, you know, an undeniably uh, beautiful and special uh, and rich uh, an extraordinary place. So people want to come. <laughs> so um, how, how do we think about tourism as something that can uh, help or hurt or something else? Maybe Danielle, you could start with that. That's something that I have been thinking since so long. I wonder how much an artist in my case, or in, in the case of my colleagues, adjusts uh, their reflection to please something related with tourism, you know. At, at least that's the question that I have been asking, you know, how tourism could affect personal expression. So you have to adjust what you feel, what you want to say to a, a for selling of something, you know. That's mm -hmm. what I could mm -hmm. uh, tell right now. That's something that I constantly am thinking about. And we are mm -hmm. also discussing with my friends, like, do you have a star in Ponce? Because Ponce is also, you know, a place that has a masquerade, you know, and has mm -hmm. expression that look like the one that are celebrated, are celebrated in Loisa. And we are always mm -hmm. talking about that, you know. Are we authentic or are we trying to, you know, accommodate our expression mm -hmm. related with uh, economic, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my... Thank you. And yeah, anything think, else on tourism? I, I think here again is as a place where Puerto Rico, we need to understand ourselves as part of the Caribbean. I feel like in the Caribbean, tourist, the tourism economy has been so studied. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's repercussions, you know, because I think a lot of times in Puerto Rico tourism before Hurricane Maria and the economic crisis, some thought it was underexploited. Uh, we didn't have 
it wasn't as significant a part of our economy as it was in other parts of the Caribbean. And some folks think that we need to change that, that it needs to be a bigger part of our economy. But before making that move, we need to look at the consequences of that and how throughout the Caribbean there's such discontent with what tourism brings, especially cruise ships, which are, you know, some of, of, of the most environmentally harmful forms of tourism that also don't have a lot of deep economic impact in the places where, where they touch, right? Because everything is consumed and spent on the ship. But also uh, the creation of resorts and, and, and the emphasis on the visitor economy instead of the resident economy. And so when everything becomes, like Daniel is saying, focused around what can you sell to tourists and what is the version of Puerto Rico that tourists wants to see and how can we build you know, roads to tourist attractions and all these things, um, you're then not thinking, well, what do we need? Where do we need the roads? What are what are the places that are culturally and historically significant to us rather than to the outside world, right? So I think and we have lessons to learn from the mistakes of the Caribbean and also from the, the places where tourism has been done a different way. And, and, and also places, not just in the Caribbean, but also in Europe, where they're also sounding the alarm of over uh, emphasis on tourism and the impact that it can have on historical places. Um, so I think to imagine instead, like, how can we make Puerto Rico an amazing place for those who live and those who visit, right? So I think if we, if Puerto Rico is somewhere that the people who live there can enjoy, can have access to parks, to beaches, to live music, to the cultural offerings of a vibrant society, that's going to be a place that other people are going to want to visit, right? Rather than packaging something um, for the outside without thinking about our own enjoyment. For, for those who are watching, the, oh, sorry, do, do we have time for no, one please. tiny? A quickie, um, for yeah. Those, for those who are, are watching this and listening to us and thinking about going to Puerto Rico, maybe they're not Puerto Rican themselves, you know, just doing research around the impact that Airbnb is having, for example, in some neighborhoods in San Juan. And I, you know, I'm, I'm very much in a self-reflection mode around this as well. I, I am guilty for I too have sinned, but you know, these, these Airbnbs are displacing a lot of housing stock that would otherwise be used for, you know, people living in Santurce, people living in neighborhoods of, um, of San Juan and all over the island, really. Um, so thinking about where it is that you want to put your dollars, um, do you want to support a locally run hotel um, where that money is going to stay um, in a community? You know, asking yourselves those questions. Um, mm -hmm. And I promise I will ask them of myself yeah. as well. But obviously this isn't solved through individual action. No, no, it no. It has to be a public policy issue. No, because I think yes, that, I that, you know, there's caveat. people, there's, it, there's no way out in a way because uh, there's a lot of people who have gone into debt to set up Airbnbs, you know, so uh, the, the Airbnb economy, the damage it's had is, is already there and it needs to be limited through kind of government policy and not just individual choices because right now the, the game is rigged, you know, there's kind of no pure clean choices if you are, you know, going to Puerto Rico. I always just say tip well. <laughs> yeah. um, so we've gone um, over and we could uh, keep talking and talking, uh, but um, uh, all beautiful things must not come to an end, but rather a little pause. Um, so um, uh, we're going to have to close our conversation now, um, but I want to thank each of you so very much for all that you brought to this conversation, uh, to uh, the knowledge and the creativity and the belief and the spirit. Um, thank you so very, very much to all of the people having such uh, an alive conversation in the chat. Um, thank you also from so many places for uh, being an active part of this. Um, this was, was beautiful. I learned so much. Um, and so Yarimar, Alana, Danielle, muchísimas gracias, mi corazón, a tuyos, and uh, to everybody else, um, to the next conversation. Thank you.